What's up? Hi, Coach TJ. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> it's going very well. We have an amazing podcast today. We have a lot of really great topics to get into. We're going to start by answering a few questions from listeners. Then we're going to talk about how athletes can go from training by heart rate to incorporating RPE or effort-based training. Because we did a podcast a few weeks back that really blew up about why you should train by effort, but we mm. want to give a few more specific instructions around how to better listen to your body's signs and signals and how to better run by effort because a lot of people said they were just a little confused on how to actually put that into practice. Then we're going to end today with a discussion around goals, goal setting, and why it's okay to sometimes embrace a season of life where you don't have a big goal on the calendar. Okay. All right. I'm into it. Uh, but first you're recovering from a 100 mile race. That's correct. The Leadville 100. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? Feel pretty good, actually. I slept weird on my neck. So weirdly, a bad night of sleep feels like way worse than, you know, being about a week out from a hundred miler. So all things considered, I think hundred mile recovery is going really well. But I think what's really <clears> mind blowing <throat> for me is how different recovery is year to year and race to race. I feel like mm. I recovered really, I mean, knock on wood, I've only done one run back and Historically, I feel like the first couple runs feel pretty good, so I'm going really easy, and I'm just stoked to be running again. And then it's always a little bit bumpier when I start doing more long runs and workouts, and I always have to remind myself to to be kind. You did a big zoom a few weeks ago, and to grade myself on a curve. Do you have any uh, like particular signs and signals that you listen to that you've sort of tracked over the years doing this kind of stuff that like indicate like maybe I need to slow it down a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I'll notice my heart rate variability is, is not that great for a few weeks after the 100. Mm. So I do sort of like use that as like, okay, that's maybe permission to really ease up on this run. Really maybe, um, push the workout to another day, be really flexible with myself so that I can maximize on that effort. But I think it's mostly, like you said, just listening to my body, paying attention to like, how was my sleep? How was my appetite? Do I have any soreness? Is my gait feeling okay? And just knowing that every return to run is different. Um, I never try to like put a timeline on my recovery from big races. I really try like, especially after a 100 or even a 100 K, unless that's part of my 100 mile buildup. I don't like to schedule like big trips, big work events, and definitely not big races or big running adventures so that I don't impose an artificial timeline on my body because it really, like, there's a lot of factors that influence recovery from any given race. How prepared were you going into the race? How hard did you race that race? Was it hot? Was it cold? How well did you fuel? Was it mostly downhill? What was the terrain like? And that, I think all of those factors just make it so it's a completely different experience every time. So I would really just encourage athletes to not impose an artificial timeline on their recovery to be kind to themselves and just be extra, extra careful in terms of like uh, right after 100 or after a big race, maybe not a great time to hit ultra sign up with a, with a beer in hand and start signing up for things <laughs> willy nilly. I'm oh. curious what you, now that you've done two 100 mile <clears throat> races, I'm curious what you've learned about the process of recovering from different big events. Mm, I think it's a great question. You know, uh, one thing that I wanted to touch on that from what you said, though, before we go into that was um, not having anything after that would influence how quickly you needed to think you were recovered. Yeah. And um, I think that's just such an important point to drive home, right? Like if you're mindful about how you set up your season, which we are going to talk about goal setting later. So, okay, not to spoil anything, but if you're mindful about how you set up your year and there should be a couple races, events that are bigger in priority and importance than others, those would be the ones not to set anything up after. So right. it feels logical in the context of Leadville 100 to think that's one of those things like hundred milers, shouldn't be taken lightly. You should not have another 100 miler uh, within the weeks after uh, or 50K or big grand uh, mountain adventure. Don't, uh, you know, make sure your expectations for that recovery process are correct. And I would say probably better to be cautious. Set yeah. lower expectations. Like 
okay, it's probably not going to feel very good to do long things for at least a few weeks after pushing my body to its very limits. Uh, you know, so for me, I take a little bit of a different approach, although I'm sure there's plenty of commonality. You mentioned tracking HRV and bringing in um, some data points, which I I actually, I've only just started doing that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> working with my new coach, he's having me do that. And it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I have a few signs and signals that I really listen to. The first one is, um, when I go out on a run, Yeah, can I breathe normally or does mm. it feel like my RPE is hard to control? Yeah. Oh, spoiler alert. We're talking about RPE later. Yeah. But am I in zone one? on yeah. these first runs back. Like, the first week back from 100, every run I'm should be... I'm in full a, shuffle mode. Yeah, it should yeah. be a 4 out of 10, very easy, forever effort-paced recovery run. I could do this for hours and hours without any doubt. Yeah. And if I'm in trying to get to that effort level and I'm still huffing and puffing and having trouble keeping my breath rate down, if I can't for sure know that I can talk... I need to be going even slower and emphasizing my recovery for longer. Yeah. That's a real sure sign your aerobic system's not recovered. The other thing that uh, was interesting for me after Western States in particular was like any run over 60 minutes, I was really hungry. Yeah. Great sign. That That happened to me after Run Rabbit for like four to six weeks after the 100, you know, even like... I was feeling hungry in normal life, so I was like much more planning ahead on my on my snacks, on my meals, making yeah. sure I was getting in more protein. But I definitely noticed like the long tail of these events is really profound because like for right. upwards of a month after Run Rabbit last year, I was getting hungry during like five mile runs around town. It was like bringing snacks and gels, yeah, which is not normal. No, and that's a good sign. Like you're not ready to go further. Yeah, don't push it. Uh, make sure you're eating really well and uh, keeping up with like just your basic needs. I think the third thing um, <clears throat> that I think about, like one, that metabolic tail, two, aerobic tail. Am I able to? keep my RPE down when I want it. Is it traveling a lot when I'm going up and down hills? Is it like, you know, going from zone two to zone four very rapidly without me controlling it? Great signs. Like you're not ready to progress in your training. You're still recovering. Yeah. Um, but the third thing that I think about in terms of like these, I guess more, a more holistic view, like a a non, um, digital kind of like HRV type of thing is mental. Mm, how, that's a big one. How am I feeling? Uh, check day, in with that stoke. Yeah, dated. Well, first of all, check day in with today. that stoke rate variability. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, am I? St- do I wake up stoked to run? Yeah. Do I wake up stoked to work? Yeah. And just you know, do I wake up stoked to dive into my extracurriculars and my hobbies and the other things that I'm interested in? Like that stoke level is a good indication yeah. of like mentally where you're at if you're kind of starting to fill your cup back up or if you're still depleted um with western states recovery a really obvious thing for me with this was like any run more than 90 minutes it felt mentally hard Mm. to stay out like i had to force it yeah and so that is just a sign that you need to just keep it chill 60 minutes or less Keep, you know, trying to do the things that help fill that cup up. Take that, you know, for me, meditation, mindfulness, deep work, like, you know, deep dives with my athletes, like the stuff that really fires me up. Like, that's what I want to lean into yeah. more than the training stuff that, yeah. like, is probably going to keep depleting my cup. Right. I think that mental aspect is such a, it can, can be an overlooked part of, of race recovery. Like oftentimes we'll talk about the post race blues, which is an understudied, uh, mental phenomenon where people will oftentimes report feeling, um, heightened anxiety or even, um, more depressive states after a big event. And this, you know, I've, I've experienced it from, you know, anything after like a 50 K to even after a 100 miler. And, you know, I think that it's it's just something like, A, that's always something feel comfortable talking with your coach about. We're here for that. Um, it's normal. No, you're not alone. And also know that it doesn't always need to reflect necessarily on the race performance. It's most likely a pretty complex interaction of both like 
focus, lack of sleep, caloric deficit, and you used a lot of brain chemicals to get that oh. race done. Oh my so gosh. So be kind to yourself. Talk with a coach, talk with a friend, talk with a trusted mental health practitioner to help you sort of navigate the acute mental health um, challenges that can sometimes be associated with these with these big races. Absolutely. It's more common than you think. <clears throat> when in doubt, take more time off. Yeah. More recovery runs well, or, you know, mix it up with yeah. cross training. Like I would you- also say if you finish an ultra and then you feel like you need to take months off or you're like, I am burnt out, never again, <clears throat> that might be a sign that you need to get in touch um, with with your goal, with your training, and make sure that you were doing an appropriate level of training and that your goal was in alignment with your values. So, And like, where you're at in the process. Yeah, you don't want to, you definitely don't want to rush back. But if you feel like after you hit the finish line, you are like, I do not want to think about running again for a long time. That's a really great impetus to sort of check in with yourself, check in with your coach. Maybe did we aim a little too high here? And this might not be a sustainable level of training for me. Absolutely. No, I think that that post that post race uh, kind of like uh, integration of insights and building that awareness is an important part of the process. Like too often I see athletes like want to jump really quickly to another goal without even integrating like the experience that they just had into yeah. who they are as an athlete currently. Um, and it's, that's especially common when we're in that and we'll talk more about goals later, but in those like B and C related goals that aren't like top priorities of the year, but are also like they have some level of importance in the architecture of a training year. And so, like, too quickly do we want to jump to, like, that next thing. But there's always insights to be had from from these events. And if you don't take the time, you're not going to get the benefits of those things. Yeah, love it. So we have some juicy questions from our listeners um, about a bunch of different topics. So I'm just going to hit you with them in sort of a rapid-fire succession. What do we have? Should runners train with a weighted vest? Can I just be like, not hot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we do hot or not on this? <laughs> sure, uh, sure. No, sure, I don't sure. think that they should. Well, this is the only yes or no. Sure. No, but if you are training for some kind of maybe like backpacking adventure or through hiking rucking, adventure. Yeah, if you're training for rucking. Yeah. Sh- yeah, or if you're training for like a through hike or something like that, rucking can be a valuable tool. Rucking being um, hiking with a weighted backpack but for runners ideally most of what we're most of the physiological adaptations we're looking to provoke are making you more efficient and building fitness not necessarily um like strength as a blunt object and there are some studies that show that you can get some efficiency or strength gains if you wear a weighted vest that's between one and five percent of your body weight which is actually like very very okay light um so you know, should you go out and buy a 20 or 40 pound vest and then do hill repeats in it? The research doesn't say so. It can actually increase your risk of injury. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, likely if you're just using a couple flasks, you're already getting a bit yeah, of a Yeah, you got a little bit of weight. <laughs> yeah. A UTMB, uh, <laughs> what a mandatory gear. That's a weighted vest. Effect. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, just no go need run to UTMB. Force it. Listen, if we're going to build strength, let's build strength. Yeah. If we're going to run, let's run. Yeah. Two very different things. Um, both equally important, but not necessarily the thing you have to do at the same time. And I think just by the nature of what running is, running on trails especially, we're building in muscular endurance yeah. through that process. No need to throw on a weighted pack unless an event that you're doing has some element of a heavy pack. UTMB mandatory gear, my pack was like a few pounds, man. Two, three flasks in there. Full. Eight pairs That's, of pants, three yeah. raincoats, Everything. an entire picnic basket, a dread of uh, or a single hair from <laughs> Ice Killian axes, head. crampons. Yeah. I mean, who knows what's going to happen on Mont Blanc that you you need all that kit yeah. and it's a twenty yeah pound pack. <laughs> So I'm going to train with that. Yeah. But I, I think that's an important um, sort of caveat is like train with the pack you expect to race with. If you're yeah. going to be, you know, if you're going to be racing with like four to five flasks between aid stations, yeah, let's go ahead and suss out what that feels like in training. If you have to have like a UTMB style mandatory kit, yeah, let's train with that. But we don't need to be strapping on a weighted vest. The current research doesn't support that. Okay. What should I do if I miss a day of training? I would say it depends on why you missed it. So something that Mm. we talk about a lot with our athletes are, is there's no makeup miles. What we want to avoid is someone, um, 
not training for a day because they felt tired or sick or something hurt. And then they think they can just do the exact same thing the next day. Oftentimes, like we'll have an athlete miss a run and then they try to run on their rest day. What you're actually doing is you're missing that rest day, which is an important day for adaptation. So you're actually shortchanging yourself, potentially a very valuable additional day for adaptation adaptations, particularly if you're experiencing something like sickness, burnout, strapped for time, high stress, oftentimes, or nine times out of 10, I'm going to tell people like, Hey, let's take the rest day. It seems like you might need it. Um, if you miss more than three days of training, that's really something where we're going to need to like entirely shift the schedule. You can't just miss three days and then pick up exactly where you left off. Oftentimes we're going to need to reconfigure some things. If you miss a week of training, we're going to need to start sort of like easing into things intentionally. Sure. You can't just miss five days and then again, expect to pick up right where you left off, especially if you've missed a workout. All of our training programs are designed with workouts in certain, at certain times for certain reasons. There's a logical progression called periodization that make the workouts all make sense in context. So if you miss a workout, you can't just, do I mean you we might shuffle it down to the next week and then move all the workouts down the line right um, or reorient it depends on what you know what your individual structure yeah. where you are but I think the key thing that you're trying to say there Zoe is if you miss one day no one day of training is that big of a deal right why did you miss it stress work related stress relationship financial whatever it is if it's a stress related illness uh, let's just take that extra day no need yeah. to try to make that up you can start training back you know, the next day that you feel healthy, um, you know, pretty much with what you have on the schedule. But if you miss more than three days in a row, then we need to make a schedule adjustment. Yeah. I mean, you know, if it's something like if I have an athlete and they're like, oh, my flight got delayed, I'm not going to get back in time for my run today. That's something where I'm like, all right, let's take today as a rest day. We can pick back up tomorrow. But again, if it's something like fatigue, burnout, sickness, injury, life stress, oftentimes let's take that additional adaptation day. So how do you know when it's time to get a new pair of running shoes? I love this question. So I actually just interviewed a podiatrist for um, Ultra Sign Up, and he sort of blew my mind by suggesting that 250 okay. <laughs> miles okay. was like a more ideal limit for running I'm shoes. I'm winning here. Well, particularly because a lot of the shoes that are coming out now have super critical foams, which yeah. are softer, and some of them can degrade a little bit faster depending on the specific compounds that are being used. I have athletes that will be like, man, I ran 500 miles in these shoes and they're not feeling too good. And I'm like, oh my oh, God. That's a lot of miles. Yeah. And this podiatrist that I spoke to said the number one reason he sees ultra runners in his practice is because they ran too long in shoes. Second reason, plantar fasciitis because of wearing inappropriate footwear. Third reason, Achilles tendonitis because of having tight calves. So do yourself a favor. I know running shoes are expensive, but an MRI is so, so much more expensive. Something that I do to help me with this, because I'm kind of thrifty with certain things and shoes are one of those things. Like I like to get them to the very last moment where I'm about to have a catastrophic injury and then I'll (laughs) throw them away is as soon as they hit 250, I throw them in the trash. Yeah. And I don't like say I'll do that tomorrow. I don't. It's like literally a routine that I have now is I just discard the shoes so that there's no I know the way my mind works. And it's just like you could get another run or two out of those. You'll order a new pair in the next few days. Yeah. And then it's a week, two weeks. And then the little niggles start. And, you know, you can avoid all of that stuff if you you know, one, know yourself well, and two, know how to combat that. Like for me, it's just getting rid of the shoes and that forces me to buy the new pair, yeah. move on to another, you know, item that's going to keep my feet healthier. But I have personally noticed that, uh, that 250 mark and I have in Strava, Again, it really, set for it, a reminder it depends on the shoe and the podiatrist said, yeah, you can get upwards of 350 mm-hmm. miles. I do know that when I worked in run specialty, I think our rule was usually like, 300 to 400. So okay. it does seem like some shoes are losing a little bit of their longevity, yeah, but we're gaining shoes. a lot more super shoes, partic- like it okay. again, really depends on the shoe. Sometimes like more robust trail shoes can last a little bit longer, especially if they're not using one of the like super light EVA foam compounds. Right. If they have a rock plate. If they have like a really like durable Vibram outsole too, can like sometimes extend the longevity. It also depends on where you're running, how you're running, the weight and biomechanics of the runner impacts the 
longevity of the shoe. Um, something that I would recommend if this conversation is freaking you out because you're stressed about having to buy a new <laughs> pair of shoes like every month. Yeah, um, it's like what, a dollar per, like, what's that breakdown that you always give that always helps me mentally when I'm about to pay for, like, a $200? I think it was, like, like 20 dollars? cents a mile, is that yeah, right? I yeah, I don't know. Something like, it's, oh, contextualize uh, it for Again, me. like, I don't know, in for a penny, in for a pound. I've been that person in the podiatrist's office with plantar fasciitis. I've seen athletes get metatarsal stress fractures because they didn't get new shoes soon enough, and it's just, like... Man, a lot of this is really preventable. And oftentimes, like, those catastrophic things don't happen when you run 351 miles. Those are the people that are, like, pretty blatantly, like, doing 500 miles yeah, and, at a time. Yeah, and a lot. With yeah. a lot of shoes over time. Just bad habits. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I would recommend, like, tracking either through your phone, <clears throat> through Strava, some way of, like, keeping track of those things. Um, but, you know, do yourself a favor. Don't, don't skimp on the most important piece of your equipment. All right, get yourself some shoes. If you're a member of the community, you get a oh, what, 10 to 20% off Runner's Warehouse. Pumped on that. Yeah, so hey, you know what? That's not nothing. Yeah. So, you know, sort of looking back at our conversation we had a few weeks ago about RPE or relative perceived effort, we had a lot of questions about like, okay, I'm someone that right now trains with heart rate, but I want to transition to RPE. I wanted to sort of give some advice and frameworks for making that transition because mm -hmm. I also don't believe like if you're currently training by heart rate and it is like feeling pretty good for you, like that's fine. I think the most ideal scenario is that we use all of the best tools at our disposal to have the most well-rounded and holistic view of our fitness and effort as possible. So I, yeah, let me jump in though, yeah. because I think if you're one of those athletes who's still training exclusively by heart rate, just a couple of the, of the things that why there's issues there, caffeine intake, sleep, sleep stress, hormonal cycles. If you're an athlete that menstruates, I mean, heat, birth control, birth, sure. Uh, the list goes on and watching on. the bear season three, <laughs> just the device that you're using to record. Yeah. Most of these devices, uh, most don't use your watch. Most of, it, the thing that blows my mind is that most watches, like the wrist rate heart monitors and watches, haven't been tested on melanated skin. So they're just I, like fully not calibrated for a lot of the human experience. It's true. It's true. I, I will say this. Um, in my coaching experience, athletes who have watches that were made in the last two to three years, particularly Garmin, does fairly well with wrist based. Um, and I've, is that a word that you get excited to use in your training fairly well? Like it's good. It's enough. all right. It's, it's good. Right? It's good enough to corroborate. Sure. What the athlete feels if right. you need to bring in another data point. Okay. And I think that that's important, but the moral of this story is that it's how you feel first and how you feel is basically RPE and right. why we want to use that because that's not going to be affected by these other variables, whether your watch is three years well, old or five years it, old. It is going to be inherently more subjective, but in a way that's actually more helpful. Right. So that's kind of what we're looking at is like helping calibrate our perceived experience even more <laughs> correctly. And I think that again, like I'm, if I have an perceived athlete that likes to train like by heart rate, that's great. But I always want to make sure that it's taken into context with RPE. I think the worst case scenario is when someone says, well, my heart rate said this, but I felt this and I trust my heart rate. Anytime I have an athlete that tr trusts the data or like some dumb shit that their watch is telling them more than themselves, that's where I think we have a problem. Well, let me bring in a, a, a piece of experience from my training this week. So I'm doing uh, 3K, 5K efforts, um, five minute long intervals, and I've never done uh, work like this for this long. This is a totally new training experience mm -hmm. for me and approach. Like I've never been explicitly told by a coach to run at 10 out of 10 RPE for five minutes. For five minutes. I don't exactly know what that feels like. I'm trying to get a grasp for it. We've done a few shorter workouts, four minute long intervals, very difficult. And throughout the process, I have been monitoring my heart rate because mm -hmm. I have a very good idea. I've been training for a long time what my max heart rate is and what my heart rate zones are because I look and I look like, okay, here's how I feel. Here were the associated heart rate zones. Right. And it's not because I'm training with the heart rate. It's just because I'm curious about yeah. some of that, the underlying um, other data that I can have. 
And so I noticed in myself a lack of maybe confidence Mm. in my ability to execute these workouts. So I was really looking at my heart rate and making sure I was getting my heart rate up, 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 up on all of these workouts. And then I got to this workout this week and I was pushing as hard as I could. And my heart rate was not going up very Hmm. high, not as high as in the other workouts. And so my self-talk was... I'm not hitting the right zones. Right. And this is inherently the flaw of That's using right. heart rate training because <clears throat> when I looked back at my grade adjusted paces for this hill workout, certainly I was in the right zone. Right. And you so, were running hard. Yes. And so whatever it was with whatever was going on that day, my heart rate just wasn't going up as high and or the device was wrong. And so, I mean, like later in, you know, we think about like accumulated fatigue later at different phases in your training cycle. Yeah. I would expect to see either heart rate drift or like maybe like some suppression to an extent. Correct. So, you know, again, the moral of that story, the reason for bringing in that example is if I continued to not, if I didn't know those things, I would have continued probably at little benefit to myself is to run even harder. Right to lose form, yeah. to break down, and then to lose all the other benefits of the workout. But right. instead I knew yeah. and was like, okay, don't worry about that. Just go as hard as you can without losing form. Yeah. Maintain that. And then, you know, we went. I went back through and I was like, no, this was spot on. Something else was going on with the heart rate, whatever. Not a yeah. big deal. You hit the underlying intention of this workout. And the, the problem, again, is that, you know, when you have less experienced athletes, that could influence how they train. Right. However, when you have RPE and you have started to have an idea of what those different um, zones feel like, then you just know. Yeah. And so you just stay in those zones and it's way better for trail running, especially. For sure. Yeah. I think again, like I think a lot of these things are best used in conjunction. I just never want athletes to only pay attention to heart rate. I think it can be a valuable tool used in corroboration with RPE. So, um, I think an important thing to do is to get to know the RPE scale. Yeah. What's the scale all about? So, you know, I tend to use the scale of one to 10 where like, you tend to use the most reliable, most well-known scale. That's good. Well, that, and like a lot of people know the zone five model, which I can use as well. I just like having a little more variability, nuance, a little more nuance on the back end of that scale, particularly for newer athletes. I think one to 10 is pretty intuitive. So like one to three is like, One is like Netflix. Three is like walking to get coffee um, with like progressing down the line until you get to 10 out of 10, which is max effort. Um, There's also the five zone model, which I think can be really useful where recovery run is zone one. Endurance run is zone two. Steady state is zone three. Tempo run is zone four. Intervals are zone five. Um, And so what I want athletes to do who are like, okay, well, I'm currently using heart rate, but I want to train a bit more intuitively and I want to start to get better at using RPE so I can communicate with my coach and make sure that I'm hitting the correct effort levels as calibrated in the training is to practice. So think about incorporating RPE into your training runs and RPE reflects how hard you perceive your body is working. So remember, it's inherently subjective. That is the strength of it. So use it to guide training based on how you feel on that day, right? Like it always has to be specific to that day. For example, if you planned a zone two workout, but your RPE suggests you're pushing zone three, but you didn't get a good night of sleep. It was a stressful day at home. Work was tough. Consider easing off it to maintain the desired intensity. Even if your watch maybe says you're in the correct zone. If you're like, I just know this is a little too hard ease up, trust yourself, trust the heart rate monitor between your ears. Well, and it go right. And it go, it goes back to what we were mentioning around recovery. You know, if you're having a hard time maintaining your <clears throat> desired RPE, uh, especially if it's an easy effort run, you know, RPE five, uh, maybe to RPE six out of 10, if you're having trouble go slower. Yeah. Because that's just indicating that that pace isn't correct for yeah. you on that given day. And there are a lot of variables that impact these things, as you mentioned. Um, and it's it's really, uh, it's key that athletes, when they're looking at that, they're not also looking at pace or heart rate and being like, but my heart rate is this. 
I could go faster or my pace is this. Uh, it's usually that. Let me speed up, even though I feel like this is already yeah. RPE 5. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, outside of paying attention to your watch, your body is giving you a lot of really valuable signals. You can pay attention to things like your breath rate. Um, I think running without music is really useful for people that are really trying to more correctly calibra calibrate their RPE um, and do the talk test. Run with a friend. If you can speak in full sentences, you're probably keeping it pretty easy. So I think that little simple things like that are oftentimes underutilized by people who like runners tend to overcomplicate very yeah. simple concepts. Do you ever sing out loud to yourself or talk out loud All to yourself when you're trying to like oh, yeah. make sure I sing a lot when I'm like running super well, having like a flow yeah. moment and I'm like checking in like, okay, yeah. you better check in, bro. Is this really like RPE yeah. six out of 10? Are you really still easy? Then I'll start to say a few what's things your, out loud. What's your go-to singing while running song? Uh, I don't really have one. I'm lame. Mine's like WAP. WAP. <laughs> that, the sentences aren't that's a long perfect, enough. That doesn't no, work. No, that's great. It's, Get a bucket and a mop. That's some wet ass pussy. I'm talking WAP, WAP, WAP. It's perfect. Everyone should learn the song and implement it in their training to gauge their effort. Is Megan that? the Stallion's a genius. Okay. I want her to have a Pulitzer. I usually just say really dumb, obvious things to myself. Like, yeah. hi, I'm out here testing to see if I can <laughs> run testing, easy is this right thing now. On? Hello, is hello. this an easy pace right Macaroni now? Macaroni in the not? pot. <laughs> so I think, again, like, pair it. If you're someone who currently is using HR training, you've got a monitor, continue to use that. That's an okay tool to lean on. Use HR training as a complementary method. It can give you a more comprehensive understanding of your training and help you calibrate your intuition with your physiology Incorporate RPE and heart rate into your training strategically, though. For instance, during an easy long run, pay attention to your RPE to ensure that you're maintaining a comfortable pace. Post-workout, go back and evaluate your heart rate to understand how your body is actually responding and how that corroborates with how you feel. Right. This combination, I think, is a really powerful way to help strike the right balance between effort and physiological response. A couple other tips that, that I have for this is, like, use your workout days to help mm -hmm. uh, gauge your RPE. So, like, for example, strides. 9 to preferably 10 out of 10 RPE on yeah. those. So that is the hardest you can go. Yeah. So it should not be the same as five out of 10 RPE or seven out of 10 RPE or eight out of 10 yeah. RPE. And then you can kind of go down from there. Like, okay, what am I, what am I doing? Like I'm in a five, like me, I'm in a five, three to five K trainings, uh, build right now. Okay. Nine to 10 out of 10 RPE. Yeah. And then that gives me a lot of more context to base my easy runs off of. So then, okay, what if we do threshold eight out of 10 RPE? Uh, that feels like this. Okay. That no, that's wrong because that's, that's my stride effort. No, that's wrong. That's my 5k effort. I have mm -hmm. to back mm -hmm. it up down a little bit. Yeah. I think oftentimes when I have an athlete that's struggling on the top end and they feel like they can't quite, um, like they don't have as much variation between hard and very hard efforts, oftentimes that means we need to go even slower on our easy efforts. Because if sure. you feel limited on that top end, that often means that our baseline isn't calibrated properly. Right, absolutely. Slow down those easy days. They should feel real fucking easy. Super easy. Can't go too easy on your easy days. Cool. So I wanted to talk a little bit about short and long-term goals. It's yeah. kind of, um, I feel like I'm in a weird place with my training because I just completed a goal that I've had for years and years and years. Um, I feel okay about it. Like I, you know, I, you know, I, I feel like this is sort of a point that I get to at the end of each season. I set a big ambitious goal. I meet it. And then I allow myself to process that before I start thinking about what I want to do, like in the next one to five to 10 years. And like, I always have like a 10 year plan. Right. And I always want to make sure each year sort of fits into that 10 year plan. But, you know, there was like a little bit of a moment where I sensed in myself a bit of discomfort of like, ah, I've been training for Leadville so specifically since my name was drawn in the lottery. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I shift towards a new sort of place in my training where I don't have a very specific goal on the calendar? I think this is something that a lot of athletes can struggle with. I'll notice like after an athlete, you know, oftentimes someone will sign up, will run their first ultra, will train for six months. They love it. Things are great. They get to the finish line. They're like, huh, I don't actually know what's next. I don't have a goal. Should I keep training? What's the point of training? What's the point of coaching? Right. Actually, it's probably one of our top three reasons why athletes discontinue coaching is because they 
have this arbitrary connection between doing the work and a goal. Yeah. And it's natural to have that connection, but that's not the only connection we should have. Yeah. And um, without a goal, does that mean that I have no anchor? I have right. no point in the future to anchor upon. I have nothing for my thoughts, words, and actions today to be guided by. And without that, who am I? What am I doing? Why am I even yeah. co- you know, being coached? Why am I even running every day? Um, well, that goes back to, you know, for you, Zoe, like why – why are you running right now? Well, your individual motivations, your individual why, your individual values, uh, that like more spirit side of the holistic kind of umbrella of things, like the deeper parts of you. Right. Um, that has to be there. That has to be there when you have a goal and when you don't have a goal. You have to be very aware of that. Totally. And the athletes who tend to perform the best long term are people who like, yeah, like sometimes do set really specific or ambitious goals, but they don't always need to have something on their ultra sign up page to get out the door. And I think that's like the biggest thing I really try to work with athletes on is like, it is okay. And actually it can be really, really positive to not have a specific race goal on the calendar. A, you can do fun adventures like training for the, you know, TMB is a great goal. Training to be like a fitter dad and pick up your kid. Also a great goal. I think that it, you athletes really limit themselves if they can only conceive of training as always being working towards a specific goal. I'm always training for the next thing. Do I know what the next thing is? No, but I have like a 10 year plan that I feel really connected to. And also I just really like running and inherently like for me, every day is about getting a little bit better and stacking bricks day over day over day. And if I only ever showed up to stack bricks on the days where I was thinking specifically about a goal, you're just not stacking enough bricks. Do you think more athletes resonate with that, like, I just like to run mm. philosophy, but then kind of get sucked into the culture of our sport, which is highly goal oriented and then feel like they have to be performative in terms mm. of like, I have like, Hey, good to see you today. What yeah. are you training for? And you so, have to like have an answer to that. I'm, <laughs> I'm working part-time at ultra sign up doing podcasting and some writing and editing. And a, a fact that I think about really frequently is the majority of people who do a race on ultra sign up only ever do one. What? And to me, that's heartbreaking. Oh, the no. majority of people. Um, oh and that's gosh. a lot of like, to me, I mean, my, my co-host on the trail red uh, trailhead podcast Buzz Burrell calls it didifying where they just do things to did them yeah, <laughs> and sure. they just diddle, <laughs> they didify. Oh. And I think that that's like a really like that. I mean, it's just heartbreaking for me because you're missing out on so many amazing experiences and I run for fun. I run for connection. I run in a way that is really in alignment with my values. And occasionally there are goals that also resonate with my values, but to me it's values first goal second. And I trust that the training will will follow. So and the evidence, and again, that's not our client base, our client base. Like we, we expect that our clients are actually really, really committed. We are curating a culture of excellence. So our athletes are definitely above average, I would like yeah. to say, but I think the data indicates that most people who dabble in our sport are, Oh, I just have this one goal. I'm going to do it. And then that's all I'm ever going to do. But you know, those aren't the people who are on the podium at Leadville. Those aren't the people who are getting the, you know, who are getting to run Western States or whatever goal is meaningful to you. Again, like sure. it doesn't have to be a hundred mile race, like showing up with confidence to your local group run, being the best mom you can, being the best partner, being the best dog mom, dog dad, whatever is like important for you. There is a way to approach that in training. So for me, like from my perspective, goals just aren't the only way to grow as a human and an athlete. And I think we can all get a lot more comfortable with having that the opportunity of a blank calendar. Well, yeah. And I think that there is a lot of opportunity in that. Like if you are one of those athletes, I mean, it's August 27th and a lot of people have already done their big race for the year. And some people have maybe their big a race in the fall or one more this fall. We're getting down to I got the a last... lot of folks with fall marathons yeah, coming Yeah, I mean, up. we're getting down to like those last three or four months before, you know, the snow starts to fall and we get into winter training where, you know, there are some goals and then there are some folks who, you know, have just finished their big thing. Like you, Leadville, for example. Well, what do I do now that I haven't finished this goal? Uh, how should I spend my time? 
and they're asking those kind of larger questions. And my call to action for those people would be don't do anything. Mm. Sit in that. Just yeah. engage in the process of running and see what comes up in a few weeks' time. Don't rush that and try to manufacture something. Just simply be there yeah. and experience running without that anchor point necessarily or that anchor point to a tangible goal. Maybe this allows you to further anchor to your values, your motivations. So I think for some folks, like the simpler and more pure side of, of why they do this, like what you said, Zoe, like just for the sake of running. Yeah. Like I run because I love to run. Yeah. And I think society tends to reward people who publicly and loudly set goals. But and yes, meaningful achievements are always worth acknowledging and celebrating, but it just isn't the only system in which people and athletes can grow. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what I call no goal opportunities, which is that opportunity of the of the empty calendar. So as coaches, you and I are really used to guiding coaches or guiding athletes along their journey of self-discovery and traditional sporting goals like a personal best, podium performance, race finish, race time can be a vital part of that, but they just aren't necessary. So what opportunities do athletes pursue if they aren't pursuing these conventional victories? And I think not having a set of fixed goals allows for more flexibility and keeps the door open to take advantage of unexpected opportunities. Mm, I like that. While goals and flexibility aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, strict goals can make it more difficult to be opportunistic. Having greater elasticity around your goals can also be really helpful when completely unforeseen circumstances emerge. And it might be actually easier to pivot and grow in a new way if you're not hyper-focused on a very specific outcome or event. You know, like when I'm training for a big race, I don't travel as much. I, you know, turn down some stand-up opportunities and I turn down some work assignments so that I can focus on the running. And I'm really enjoying being able to lean into other areas of my life sort of in the in the wake of Leadville. But I think what's always important is just because you don't have something on the calendar, that doesn't mean you shouldn't still be training with intention. I think it's always important to have like maybe a structured down season of like, maybe we just vibe and do some aerobic training. We're not doing a ton of long runs, not a ton of workouts. But I think that if you feel you need quote unquote, a big old off season where all you're doing is biking or skiing and you need a ton of time away from running, that's a red flag that we're likely doing an inappropriate, a, a, tr- a level of training that's not a correct fit for your current resources and bandwidth. No off seasons. No off seasons. So keep training, keep training with intention. You don't need a big race goal to stay committed. Commitment is a way of being. It's not a response to environmental circumstances. Mm. And I think it's really important, again, that my training reflects my values, not just my goals, and that my goals should also reflect my values. It all starts with the values. Goals are secondary. Sure, exactly. And I think, again, touching on that spirit side, the deeper side of each each one of us has and allowing that side of us to come out. If we're constantly in that lily pad goal to goal to goal, are we really ever aware of the big changes that we're making, the progress that we're making? And what if we don't reach the goals that we set for ourselves? What if we have a DNF? What if we don't, you know, make the podium? Um, where are where is that joy factor coming mm. from? The more we're focused on goal to goal to goal, the more pressure we feel to accomplish those goals, the more rigidity, the narrower our identity gets around those things, the less room there is for flexibility, as you mentioned. And then the um, kind of certain expectations and the set of um, expectations that we set for ourselves there become so narrow that if we don't hit those things, we eventually don't feel good about ourselves. Yeah. And it's a huge issue, right? So we have to have these periods where we just simply run. Yeah. We just, you know, we engage in the act of running for for the just the pure re- reason of just to run because yeah. hopefully we enjoy it. And that, you know, helps to fill the cup. That helps to fulfill the balance that we all need between being kind of like hyper-focused on a goal and also wanting to have that flexibility. I do really like how you tied that into well, this helps to curate a flexible mindset. And you can then take that mindset into periods when you're training for a goal. We all know that if you're more rigid, you set yourself up for greater kind of reckoning moments, much more tough mental health outcomes. So flexibility is a great way to get the post-race blues. 
Right, exactly. Like, honestly, like, it's, it's, so, it's key. So how do you coach athletes on deciding what a, what an appropriate A race is? A sort of being like your premier event of the year. Right, and I think I have a criteria I like to use with athletes for this. Um, but at first, you know, I don't create goals for my athletes. No, I want to be clear about that. Yeah. The goal is the athletes and yeah. the athlete that I'm in my privilege is that I get to, to be a participant in receiving that feed and offering feedback and not, and, and offering a perspective mm. that the goals are not my goals. The goals are the athletes goals. So the athlete can come to me with, with whatever, yeah. And I'm going to give them a realistic perspective on whether or not that goal is accomplishable in the timeline that they're presenting it to me on. And it's one of the hardest parts about mm. being a coach in my yeah. experience because it really plays to this dichotomy of serving versus pleasing. Like mm. my in my my nature is like, oh, I want to make sure this person is like feels really excited and good. And so like, I so want to say yes, but also you are so not ready to do that in the next six months. That is an 18 month goal. And, you know, having to have those very honest, um, discussions, you know, I, I really invite that in. That's one of the things that I look forward to most in coaching. One of my North stars as a coach is respect for the athlete and telling someone that, they can do something that you just know that they likely don't have that they can't yeah. is not a way of respecting them. Even though it might seem like the polite thing to do, that's not a loving action. That's not no. a compassionate action. And it certainly isn't respectful of their time and their energy. No. And it's just bad coaching. It's bad coaching. It's not, it's, it's <laughs> frankly, it's not coaching. It's not you know? coaching. So, you know, people who get paid to tell you nice things over the phone, that's a whole different industry. You know, my heart crumbles a little bit and then I'm like, but I'm here to coach. Yeah. And so that is, you know, and I love this part because I like to talk about the timelines Mm. and I like to talk about the athlete's experience because timeline and experience, that's going to dictate whether or not the athlete's going to be capable of, uh, basically accomplishing that goal or not, or, or being ready to do the training that's going to set them up to take a stab at that goal. And so I have a criteria. If we've established that we have the right timeline and we have the right experience to pursue that goal, I then have a little criteria that I like to go through with my okay. athletes on our deep dives. Hit me with that criteria. So the first What's number one? thing is you have to deeply want the goal. Mm. What does that mean? So that's, I usually ask an athlete a question uh-huh. to see if they deeply want it. So I say, ask yourself, would you do this if you couldn't tell anyone about it? And this is because like our big races, they should be, they shouldn't be a leap. They should be kind of the step and they should ask us to look deep within to, they require like full commitment, heart, Mm. soul, like the whole thing. Like you have to be all in to do them. Um, So the best way to ensure that you're all in on it is that if intrinsically you would do it, like, I'm going to do this race. I will never be, and I can never tell you about it. It's yeah. purely for me. I'm still going to do it. I would still be really excited to do it. Okay. If you can check that box, let's do it. Love uh, it. Second thing, it has to be scary. Ooh, what does that mean? So like you should feel Like should I get scared. butterflies in my tummy yeah, when I think definitely. about it? Like you should be scared about it. Like you should be like, oh shit. Like yeah. the, this is big. Like yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. You know, yeah. there should be an inkling of a doubt. Like yeah. that's how you know it's a real A race. The way I think about it in myself is like if the goal feels sticky, like there's something about that I like feel a sense of like curiosity, excitement, maybe a little fear around, but there's like there for me, for something to matter, I, there needs to be, it needs to not be assumed. Like yeah. for me, uh, an element just of finishing a 50 K, not that exciting to yeah. me. And that's, if that's someone else's goal, that's totally fine. I'm just speaking like from a in of one here, I need to put something up on the board that really fucking means something and is like scary and is not assumed. And so like having for me specific times, thinking about maybe some, some specific outcomes is a great way to like, add a dash of fear to a goal for me. Totally. You have to create uh, some uncertainty for yourself because you won't benefit 
a damn from it other than, you know, the external validation of finishing if there's no uncertainty and there's no discomfort. Right. Those are integral in the growth process. So we want our A races to have that in there. So it's like a race, well, I'm sure I can finish this, but uh, I'm going to set a time goal yeah. that's scary. Spicy. Right. You know, spicy goal. Or I'm going to set performance standards that I've never met for myself before, mm. and I'm going to really challenge myself mentally for this race. Or whatever it is, an element of uncertainty or scariness, like I'm not sure I can complete this, um, is, is really important. I also feel like sometimes if a goal isn't scary, that might be like, are you protecting yourself from getting vulnerable by picking something that's just not doable? Like, yeah, I want to run sub 14 at Western States. I'm not doing that anytime soon. Doesn't matter how many ketones I take. It just isn't happening. So that goal isn't actually scary to me because it's just not possible. So fear can sometimes be a positive and educational feeling that helps us understand like, Oh, meeting my potential and realizing that is an inherently kind of scary thing. So just cause it's scary doesn't mean it's bad. And oftentimes having a little bit of like a spicy amount of fear, maybe not like Thai hot, but like, you know, like Nepalese gas station hot, that can be really good. And I think that's, that's our third uh, criteria that you have to meet for an A race. So mm. the goal has to feel like a step, but not a giant leap. Yeah. So it can't be so big that you know, you're not going to be able to accomplish right. it. Um, it has to be a logical next step. What does that often look like in practice for athletes? Um, I think that's like picking that next uh, outcome goal. Mm. So like if you are comfortable with a specific distance, it's picking that next goal that's going to challenge you to be on your growth edge. Or it's going to be like, okay, I've done several hundred Ks. The next step is the 100 mile. Or, you know, I've run a fast 5K. Now I want to turn that into some real endurance. Let's go for the 10K. You know, it's, it's picking like logical steps mm. where, um, and this is so important from a mental performance standpoint, because good performance, it is integral that you feel you have the skills capable of accomplishing what you right. want to accomplish. And if you, if it's too outlandish, a big giant leap, you're going to do something to self-sabotage right. that event. Um, so you really want to make sure that your skills are somewhat in line with what you're trying to accomplish and then obviously good coaching is going to coach to that gap to build the self-efficacy right. to build the competence in the time frame that you've established um so that's where that step is and then obviously you fill that step and then you toe the line and then you're ready to perform yeah and oftentimes you're working with a coach to set intermediary goals in the meantime too absolutely so what's criteria number four for a good goal so uh, an A race is going to ask the athlete to change a habit or a belief. Oh, this one is really tough for me. <laughs> this I one know. is so sticky, sticky and vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might have to start believing in myself and right? being confident. So like an A race is going to ask you to transform something. Uh -huh. It's going to it's gonna show you uh, a weakness that you need mm. to work on. It's going to show you something that you need to think critically about, um, critically, not judgmentally. There's a big difference there. We don't want this to, you know, critically doesn't inherently mean negative. You no, know, it's just like critically. with, with an accurate appraisal of something. A great goal is going to ask you to change something that you're going to be able to carry <sighs> forth with, you know, carry with yeah. you, um, into the future. And I, I think like, um, a common one for, for some people is like asking for help. Mm. Like, oh, if I have to run 100 miles and uh, that involves crew and, or a pacer or something. Or a like, coach. Like that's a, a big coach. one. I think when people set a big goal, like I want to do, you know, I want to run a sub four hour marathon. I want to finish my first half marathon. If you're not willing to recruit help via a coach, like oftentimes I would say, I, I would question some people's connection to that goal absolutely and well we might as well just go there that Take leads me there. us to do it the fifth part of our criteria an a race requires help if so you think what you does can, that look like like it, does that always mean crew can that mean different things it, it requires help mm. whatever that means to you um it means you, you're not doing this alone yeah that it's a team endeavor whether right. that's finally enlisting a pt 
Mm. Uh, finally hiring a nutritionist to look at your sodium sweat test and help you with the hydration yeah. plan. Uh, finally asking for a pacer to, to take, you know, to be with you on the race. Like you can't do it alone. And this is huge. Mm. If you think you've chosen an A race and you can do it all yourself, choose a goal that is more difficult. Dream the fuck bigger. Bigger. You are in small vision syndrome, my friend. Mm. And that's not a place of growth. And so these goals have to require help. That can be working with the coach you've worked with for seven to 10 years. I don't care. But it involves other people. Yeah. And I I think this is integral also to that kind of transformation piece. I think so too. For a lot of folks. All right. What is criteria number six for selecting an A goal? This is probably my favorite one. The goal allows you to live the life you want to live. I love this. Okay. Tell me more about, about this. So, uh, goals are great motivators. They have the power to be, like I said, transformative for Mm. us. They can Mm -hmm. help us change our habits, routines. They can help us lean more into joy. So like a great race, if you were to like zoom out 16 weeks to your A race and be like, what would, what would bring you stoke? You know, that race should set you up to train on the terrain that you love to train on with the people you love to be with, like to have the conversations you want to have to bring the kind of focus and way of being that you've always wanted to bring to your life. Like it should ask you to rise up a little bit in service of that person inside you that you really want to be and become. Um, It's not an A race if you have to be comfortable. Mm. Like it's just simply not really an A race. You could call it that. You could pay lip service to it. Cool. (laughs) But, but deep it's down, not you'll really know. that. Yeah. Like this should give you like you should use this to give yourself permission to like live the way you've always wanted to live. Yeah. So something I was thinking on, there was a Trail Runner magazine article that came out before Leadville about um a racer who was living like a monk in Leadville and all he did was wake up, train, live in Leadville, repeat. And I love that he's living his best life and that we had similar yeah, goals. Yeah. I would, I would guess we, uh, you know, graded on a gender curve here. Um, the way that this goal inspired me to live my best life was really, really different for me. Like living my best life yeah. through this goal meant allowing myself to get out on a trail run on a Thursday, even though I have client calls or I have a, I have a draft due. it meant like having fun Alpine, like, on the weekend, it meant doing fun runs, not being necessarily obsessed about nailing the absolute perfect amount of vert or like I did not spend nearly as much time on the level course as a lot of other women. I also didn't drop everything and move to Leadville for the summer because that's not the life I wanted to live. However, I still set a goal that enabled me to do that. I still allowed myself to lean into training, to treat myself like an elite athlete, to take care of my body, to connect with other people and to focus on my training in a way that felt good to me. And even though I think I initially really judged the live like a monk guy, I came to a place of like, man, it's really cool that we both ran the same race, probably had similarly competitive goals. And I think it allowed us both to I have to assume live our best lives and that can look really different from person to person. Let me tell you about the sciences behind this. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. It's a joke about John Tapper. Um, I want to do like this. This makes so much sense because no matter what you do, how much work you put into this, the result is uncertain. Yeah. So you better enjoy the hell out of the time you spend working towards it and get to that start line saying, I live without compromise. I live my best fucking life doing this. And you know what? If I can put the cherry on top and have an amazing race, great. And if I can't, I still have all of this awesome experience to look back on. So I can say, you know what? This was worth it. This was an integrity with who I am. Dance like nobody's watching. Train like the outcome is not guaranteed. It's not. And it never is. So what is criteria number seven for selecting an A race? Number seven. This is it. Ooh. It's all that's left. Okay. If you can hit all seven of these, you've got a real A race. race. Um, This is the, the spirit part, the deep side of us. Motivation. Why? Values. What? Um, who we want to be, 
who our vision for ourselves is, the uh, A race should reflect that. It should reflect really at the most basic level your values. If you haven't developed your an idea of who you want to become yet, that's okay. If you don't know all of your motivations yet, that's okay. If you don't you know, have all of that deeper understanding of who you are, that's fine. But at a basic level, understand your values, okay? That's a very important place for every athlete to work on. This should reflect that in mm. some way. Because in order to really dig deep and to finish these things that are hard, you need to have something beyond yourself right. to attach to. It can't just, you know, intrinsic motivation is wonderful. And the finishing and what that could feel like, all wonderful. But it's got to be about something greater than that. Or it's likely, you know, you'll DNF. Yeah, I love that. Well, that is such an amazing sort of framework for helping decide um, to A, allow ourselves to get uncomfortable and sit with maybe a lack of goals and still train um, with joy and with intention. And then giving us a framework to help sort of build what that next that next season might look like. Thanks yeah. so much, TJ. I yeah, love this. Totally. So, you know, keep these things in mind as you're, you know, for you, Zoe, as you're yeah. kind of navigating. Before a, I hop uh, on ultra sign up. <laughs> you're taking a, you know, some time to like, just appreciate not having anything. When ideas start going through your head, you can start using this criteria and seeing if, you know, you can check off these boxes. And then if you can, you know, you know, you've got something to seriously consider. Yeah. Cool. Can't wait for next season. All right. Let's do this.